Hey, welcome to this edition of our InvestorFuse member case studies. We profile some of our most successful customers, document how they went from doing no deals to doing a lot of deals and how they're using InvestorFuse to help manage all their operations. We're interviewing Nick Perry, who is based out of Austin, Texas. And Nick is a great dude. He's got an awesome story. He used to be a personal trainer just three years ago. It took him 11 months to do his first deal. And uh, since his first deal, he's grown a team of six, and he's consistently doing six-figure months just wholesaling. And a lot of his deals are actually coming from the follow-up sequences inside of InvestorFuse that are following up with his leads automatically on his behalf. Uh, and he says he gets one to two appointments per week just from the follow-up sequences alone. So that's super powerful. We're really happy that Nick's found so much success. And you're going to learn about some of the things that he's doing right now, uh, marketing-wise, how he's hired his team, uh, and some just really cool little insider tips and tricks to help you guys out, whether you're using InvestorFuse or not. I think this will be a really valuable interview. So enjoy, and email info at InvestorFuse.com if you ever have any questions. Thanks. Well, if I take you back to the beginning, I started about three years ago. And I just moved to Austin from Virginia. I'm actually Northern Virginia, kind of yeah, close to where you guys are. And um, came down here, had like seven grand to my name. So, you know, spent two grand of that moving into my place. And hmm. it's like, all right, I got to hit the ground running. And um, what do I want to do? I said, you know, I can make money here in Austin. I can do technology. I can do real estate. Um, and I chose to go, go into real estate. So I didn't want to become an agent. And I knew that investing was a great way to, you know, build up some money. And I inundated myself with YouTube videos, watch YouTube <laughs> videos till basically nauseam. And um, once I got enough information, I started sending out marketing. Basically, you know, spent all my money that I had on marketing. Hmm. And I went on some appointments, but I didn't really have any deals to show for it. So it was a really tough time. It was a really tough time. You know, I had to get um, real with myself and I was like, all right, you know what? I, in order to keep this dream alive, I've got to get, you know, some, some income coming in. So I went out and I got an inside sales job. Uh, I was working at indeed.com and they're headquartered here in Austin. And so I was banging the phones nine to five. <clears throat> and then, uh, you know, from five until whenever I fell asleep, I was, I was working on my business. You know, back back then I was handwriting letters, you know, licking the envelopes, sending them out. Um, yeah, and that carried on for a while and got my first call from, or my first deal from a seller that called me from months and months ago and they said, hey, we're ready to move forward. And I made $12,000 uh, on that deal. It was like a vacant probate house. The house is like falling down. I don't even know how anybody paid what they did for it, but we ended up making 12,000 and I just reinvested that right back into my business and um, was able to get a couple more deals from that. And then, to, you know, just kind of picked up from there. So, hmm. uh, yeah. So it took you roughly 11 months to, from learning the business to closing your first deal. Correct. Yeah. What were some of months. the, what were some of the other impediments that you think kept you from, getting that first deal done in say three months? Well, obviously funds, you know, I didn't have the funds available to be able to put out as much marketing as I wanted. I was doing all the letters myself. Um, additionally, not having the um, knowledge to be able to convert prospects when I had them on the phone, like I was saying dumb stuff that was killing my deals. I didn't know how to evaluate deals properly. Yep. Um, and so all that played in, you know, into account why, you know, I was spending all this time and energy and not getting anything in return. So those were probably the two biggest things that impeded me from getting, getting my first deal done. Was it just you during that time period as well? Or did you have a team? No, it was just me for the first year to 16 months. It was all me. Okay. Damn. A lot of other people in that situation, man, they're just, it's all them and they're doing that that ground level hustle work to try to get that first deal done. So in your case, it just came from follow-up. 
Yeah, it, you know, it just really came from just not giving up, right? Yeah. I mean, it's so easy to, you know, just spend a bunch of money and then be like, oh, this doesn't work. But you have to know deep down, you know, this does work. You know, you've watched other people be successful with it, and you have to, to put in the time, pay your dues, and not give up on what you, you set out to do. So as much as I kept getting punched in the face, knocked down, I just kept getting back up and getting back up. And, you know, eventually I was able to get some traction and, and get to, to where I'm at now. Hell yeah. That's it, man. People are clawing for just for that traction. When you say, you know, paying your dues, what do you think most investors mean when they say that? Like, what does that first year look like where you are paying your dues? Is it, like specifically the tasks that you're performing every day, like what are the dues that'll give you the actual most bang for your buck, so to speak? Yeah, I mean, you know, definitely in the beginning, it's gonna be a lot of time, right? Especially if you don't have a ton of money to invest in marketing, you're gonna be sitting at your kitchen table, you know, handwriting letters or, you know, cold calling people. It's just a lot of manual stuff that you have to do in order to get in front of sellers to be able to convert those people into, into appointments and, and deals. So sweat equity, I mean, you don't really know what you're doing up front either. So you also have to be continually learning. You know, it's as much of a learning process as it is a doing process. Yeah. Did you have that like systems mindset when you first started or were you just all about just like getting that first deal, talking to sellers, getting leads? What was your, what was your entrepreneurial thinking at that time? No, I mean, I got into this to, to make a lot of money. It wasn't just to do my first deal. Yeah. It was because I wanted to have, you know, the freedom lifestyle to be able to, you know, have a good life for myself. And, you know, when I'll have a family one day, have, you know, not have to worry about finances and things like that. So um, that was my motivation from day one. And I knew from the very beginning that I had to have assist, you know, systems and a team in place but I didn't know up from down at that point. So I was still trying to understand, you know, what are the best systems? You know, how do I implement these? How do I get the correct people on my team? And um, Ken Clothier was a huge, huge person that helped me, you know, see through a lot of the, um, the static out there. There's a lot of noise from a lot of different you know, areas in this business. And it's hard not to get shiny object syndrome sometimes. So he helped kind of cut through some of that fog. Yeah, Kent knows how to cut to the chase for sure, which is just a, a great skill to have, especially in this market right now where everybody's overwhelmed by stuff. So what's, what is your background? Like, what did you do before? What did you study in school? So I went to school to be a personal trainer. Um, I was going to go to a four-year college to do that. And my mom mm-hmm. said, there's no way I'm paying a, you know, you know, $80,000 tuition so you can be a, become a personal trainer. So... I went to a personal training school and um, came out of that. You know, I did in-home personal training and, you know, went to people's house. I worked at Lifetime Fitness, you know. Oh, yeah. 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 That's a sick gym. Yeah, yeah. So I got, you know, pretty burnt out on that because I was working, you know, 60, 70 hours a week, making 60 grand a year. And I was like, I just got to make more money. So that's really when my wheels started turning to – you know, what's going to make me a lot of money and where, where can I get scale? And that was when I, you know, started thinking about real estate. Did you, do you have family members or something that kind of got you on the real estate tip or how did you find out about it? No, I just knew that, you know, just from personal training, I would train wealthy clients all the time. And a lot of the wealthy clients that I would train, they were in real estate. And so I would probe around and ask them questions here or there. And so I kind of got some, some tips like, you know, this is what I'm doing with real estate. And so I just self-educated myself and started getting online and um, absorbing information. But I think from listening to wealthy people that I was training, that kind of put the bug in me that real estate was probably a good, good way to go. Yeah, it was very similar for me because I see successful and wealthy people as just people right? Like they just did that. There's no reason at all that I don't have the capacity to also 
execute on what they did and have the same result. Uh, I wish more people had that mindset, you know, cause it would, it would help them brave that initial leap of faith. You know, these other guys did it. Therefore there's no way I can't not do this. Absolutely. Um, but that's awesome. So from personal trainer to real estate mogul. So did you start with a coaching program or was your coaching program just YouTube videos? <laughs> Yeah, I was on, I was basically went to YouTube university first. <laughs> yeah. I wish I would have went uh, and got a coach from the very beginning. It would have saved me a lot of money and it would have saved me a lot of frustration and time. That was probably my biggest regret is not getting a coach soon enough. Um, I didn't really start getting significant traction until I did get a coach. You know, I went through the, the flip to freedom Academy and then um, went ahead and signed up for the boardroom and that, that really helped um, be a big catalyst in my business was, was getting in front of those, those guys. Well, now we can sort of start talking about like what you did to scale. Cause a lot of investors customers that are going to be listening to this, they're at that scale point, right? They've already figured out the business. They've got the motivation. They've got the belief that this business can scale. So now it's just figuring out how to scale without you as like the time bottleneck. And like, that's a learning experience right there because that's, that's where you can really work your entrepreneurial muscle to figure out how you can turn this operation of like getting a lead to getting another contract, to flipping it, to like updating your website and all that to build like a machine around that and then just like manage or look down on that machine and move pieces around. Where are you right now on that, like on that systems process and how did you kind of, get into that like starting from one deal how did you strategically decide uh how did you strategically scale from that point yeah you know i was working nine to five so i had to be very systems oriented to be as efficient with my time as possible so as soon as i had enough money to get a leads manager i did um and that was a critical part of my business i use ibis they do a, a fantastic job uh, answering the phones, talking to sellers, building rapport, booking appointments for us, you know, putting all that into an in investor fuse. They do a great job with that. And that was my first strategic hire that helped um, give me a lot of my time back. I was yeah. missing calls. You know, I wasn't following up with people property properly. And that really helped. And then additionally, I was using Podio but I was trying to do all my integrations by myself. I was actually mm. watching your YouTube videos and trying to copy you. And then I was I like, know. you know what? Dan's just way better than me. I'm just buying investor fees. <laughs> so I went ahead and, and got that. And it's, that's been a game changer as well. So bef before that though, so you were doing all your marketing. It was just you and you had a nine to five. This was after you closed your first deal. And so you were answering all the calls or were you letting them go to voicemail or? Uh, at that time, I was answering when I could. So, you know, if I had a little bit of flexibility in my job, if I needed to pop into a conference room and take a seller call, but it was getting too much, you know, I was really kind of skating on thin ice with that. So I knew I had to hire a leads manager and um, yeah, outside of that, you know, I would have to let it go to voicemail or I'd have to call them, you know, when I had a break or after work and that just wasn't cutting it. I knew I was losing revenue because of that. Exactly. It's like, you're not only losing the opportunity cost of closing those deals, like getting back to them within the first five minutes. You probably hear me talk about it all the time, how crucial it is to respond to leads within the first five minutes and to call them at least six or seven times. If you can't get a hold of them, like how far off were you at that point from like quitting your job? Um, I was still uh, probably about a year out. Um, the next strategic hire I made was, my acquisitions manager. So, you know, all my time spent was working. And then after work, I'd be going to appointments or doing something related to leads management. You know, my weekends were dedicated to driving wherever I needed to drive to go on seller appointments. So I knew I had to leverage my time back and get an acquisitions manager. Um, one of my closest friends, he really wanted to get into real estate as well. His name's Logan. So I went ahead and uh, brought him on. And he's nice. been, yeah, he's been incredible. So when I brought him on, um, 
I was able to have him run appointments during the day when I was at work and also on the weekend. So he's still out there. I mean, he's out there today, you know, locking some deals down. So dude, that's awesome. Yeah. It's crazy when people see that it's working, you can attract a lot of, you know, really awesome talent. Some people might be friends. Do you have any advice though, for people that might consider hiring like a family member or a friend, um, any, Thing they should tread lightly on that or um because i know it's yeah, don't, be messy yeah don't hire a girlfriend or a spouse yeah. i did that and then when i wanted to break up with her she tried to take the business and common law me so don't uh, do that. Yeah. that was expensive don't do that oh yeah that, that was pretty brutal so um if you yeah if you're you're hiring friends you know that's i've always had good luck i love working with my friends um so you just, you know, just treat them with respect. You know, that's, that's a big part of it. Yeah. I always say you hire for attitude, right? And then you train their skills and then as they perform and you work with them every day for a year, then they become your friends. Right. But if you're starting, if you're starting from ground zero with them as your, as your best friend and they don't know anything about real estate, like definitely tread lightly because it's, it's more expensive to bring on a wrong hire. Uh, than it is yeah. to just interview a couple more people, you know. Um, that was just a little quick thing on hiring. So you have six team members now, right? Yes. Damn. All right. So let's let's bridge that gap then. From you hired a lead manager, you brought on acquisitions manager. Mm -hmm. So now your time, you bought back a lot of time with just those two hires. At that point, you started using Investor Fuse. So what were the next three hires? Then we had a uh, dispositions manager. So when we get a deal under contract, he go ahead, he starts marketing it right away, takes all the buyer calls and works everything from, you know, the time that contract's on to the time we got money in the bank. That's, that's his job. Nice. Um, yep. Then additionally, we have a full-time inside sales guy and his full-time job is um, actually taking inbound calls from sellers. We do voicemail blast. And we can literally make the phone melt with her voicemail blast. Mm. So he's, he's sitting in the pocket all day fielding those calls and converting those prospects into appointments or sometimes he can close them over the phone. So that's, that's his full time job. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's a new hire. We're still getting him ramped up right away, but really excited to uh, get him fully ramped and I think it'll have a big, big impact on the bottom line. What's the difference between uh, inside sales and the lead manager? So the leads manager is strictly taking calls from our direct mail pieces and the leads that come in from our website. Okay. Our inside sales manager, he's a little bit more uh, experienced when it comes to real estate and also sales. So he can talk to those appointment or those sellers and convert them they're not as warm of a lead when they come into him. So he does okay. a bit. Yeah. So the He's lead able, manager pre-qualifies all the inbound and then he'll come in and like build rapport, set the appointment, et cetera. No, he, he's got his own book of business and his book of business revolves around, we'll get a list of, you know, 10,000 vacant properties and voicemail blast them all. Say, Hey, saw your property. You know, it didn't look like anybody was living in, I'm looking to buy property in that area, give me a call if you're looking to sell them. And then we'll let that, that voicemail blast go out and then his phone will just melt for hours. So and he's doing more of the proactive outreach prospecting type of marketing. And correct. Then the, lead, then the lead manager is just taking in all the inbound marketing. Correct. How do you get the, the phone numbers for your inside salesperson? We'll um, pull a list and then skip trace. So we'll get a list from either Kent system or, you know, listsource.com. It varies. You know, we use different list providers and then we'll send it off to the skip tracer. You know, we use da uh, datafinder.com. It's really good resources. Another resource I got at a boardroom. Nice. Yeah. It's been killer. And we'll drop that into, um, into dialer central and then just hit go and it, you know, you pre-record a voicemail kind of like you do on some of the other ones. And that's how you send out the voice blast. 
Oh, you don't use the investor views voice blast? Well, I um, guess because you, you'd have to make a separate list of leads. Correct. Yeah, exactly. You have to make a separate list. And then uh, my, my dispositions manager, he's also a licensed broker. So he already had it for his brokerage and everything. So it just it worked out. Nice. He's doing like a big annual subscription for it. So then I guess when those leads come back in, when they, when they call into InvestorFuse, you can follow up with them at a later point using the InvestorFuse voice blast, like maybe yeah. for all the, the dead leads and all that. Yeah. Yeah. And that's something that I'm glad you mentioned that because we haven't even, I didn't even thought of that. So I think totally, totally make use of that. Yeah. We recommend using it on deal disposition. So you just send it to your buyer, like a new deal to your buyers list, just record a quick audio file, send that out. And then for dead lead to re-engage them, like every six months, you can uh, just send all of your dead leads, like a quick, Hey, we're still buying houses type message. Yeah. I like that. It's a good tip because they are, they already called you. So you know, it's not a complete waste of time to follow up with them. Mm -hmm. So then you ha then you hire two more people. So let's keep, let's keep going to, to now. So you kind of slowly scaled it up or did you have like, when was your first six figure month? June. So just, hell yeah. Now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're, Congrats, man. Damn. Yeah, we're, on, we're on pace for another one this month. So, we're super excited about that. <laughs> okay. So it, did you, it was it just like incremental month after month, you just started closing more deals or the deals got fatter or how did yeah, you, I mean, how did you scale it? Spend kind of a combination of both. We, we definitely had more deals, uh, Q2 than any other, other month we had. And then we also had a couple big pops as well that, you know, really helped out and we wholesale, we did one wholesale deal for 52,000 and, yeah, so that was yeah, that was yeah. nice. Um, All in Austin area. We do Austin and San Antonio. Our next, well, we got we just hired a full time bandit sign person too. They're uh, out five days a week putting up bandit signs, and they track them through an app called Simple Crew. It geopins all the signs. Hell yeah, that's my buddy's app. Oh really? Yeah, yeah. we love it. We use it. I use it every night. So. I wake that's up. That's awesome. And I'm like, oh, cool. Here, here's all the places. <laughs> cool. I'm gonna tell them that. That's awesome. <sighs> yeah, cool. and, and so that's been going real well. We do, you know, 500 signs a week, and then um, yeah. right now, in terms of where we're at, in terms of strategic hires, I'll probably get a another leads manager to fill in on the weekends. You know, right now that kind of falls back on me. So, you know, in order to buy back some of my weekend time, I'll get another leads manager to get some. Mm -hmm. some additional bandwidth there and um, then we'll, we'll kind of reevaluate and, and see what we need next. I mean, with our inside sales position, I could see that that scaling out where we need another, another one of those and um, continue to grow that division. Do you have an office? No, we're all, all remote right now. So tight. Yeah. I kind of like it. Isn't that that way. amazing. Yeah, yeah. It's just amazing that you can do I, it. I've, I've thought about the office, but I'm like, I kind of like being remote. So, what well, kind of tell us a little bit about the current marketing you're doing and are you pulling a lot of deals from those bandit signs? I'm sure people are willing are trying to hear about that because people are always like flipping coins about if they should do bandit signs or not. Yeah. I mean, that's been, that's been killing it right now. Pay-per-click and direct mail is extremely crowded, crowded, you know, marketing medium, right? Everybody's doing direct mail. Everybody's doing PPC. You know, what are the areas where there's less competition? And for our market, it's bandit signs. You know, most people are too lazy or too scared to go out and put up signs. So we'll take, we'll take full advantage of that. Yep. Mm -hmm. Dude, and we a that's it. That's the secret. You just do what the other investors aren't doing. We get that's more it. calls from those than, than anything else. So, that's you know, we're crazy. Crazy. Yeah. Okay. So that's six. So let's talk about, you're still pulling deals from direct mail and online, just not as much. Correct. And yeah, I mean the, the cost per lead on direct mail and paper click definitely in where I am in central Texas. And I know talking to other investors around the country is just, you know, it's steadily increasing, you know, and it, I'm sure it'll go back down when there's a market correction and everything. But right now, you know, lead cost is, is you know, 
steadily on the rise for those two. Totally. And the only way you can really compete in the direct mail or inbound space is through follow-up, right? And how, how good nurturing, how good you are at nurturing the leads and how good you are actively staying on top of them. Yeah. I mean, before, you know, I was doing investor for you, I was about to hire a full-time follow-up person because I knew there was a lot of missed opportunities slipping through the cracks. And so hmm. investor fuse is very helpful in staying in front of those leads and putting that whole follow-up system on autopilot. Now we still have our, our leads manager reach out and put a phone call in regardless on top of yep. the follow-up system, but we get, you know, texts backs and, and calls back all the time from our follow-up sequence. People like, yeah, let's, you know, sorry, I've been busy or, you know, whatever the excuse is. And, but can you come out and see the house? Yeah. So yeah. We probably get, you know, another one to two appointments a week just from follow-up sequence. You get one to two appointments a week just from those automated follow-ups. Yeah. So actually, would you mind like doing a screen share for, for those that are listening that kind of want to see how you got things set up? But yeah, what do you want me to put on Clarity? Uh, yeah, yeah. It'd be cool to kind of see just the screenshot of your... Yeah, hang on uh, one sec. Okay. And then I know you, you got... You had one deal from the follow-up sequence that you made like 64K on or something like that? Yeah. That was shortly after uh, that flip to freedom. We, I think it was like the first week we enabled follow-up sequence. And I was like, oh, this is sick. Yeah, give us a little tour and show us like how your team uses yeah. it. And if, you, and if you want to show us that 64K deal too, just to inspire some people. That'd be yeah, cool. you know, I'm not as organized as putting everything all the way through my transactions tab as I need to be. Sure. Uh, but I'll show you kind of the meat and potatoes of, of how we use Investor Fuse and, and why it's been so powerful for us. So yep. you see, you know, all leads that came in today, we get them from all over the country. So anybody listening right now, if you guys want leads and you want a JV on them, message me because we're throwing a lot of these away. Dude, uh, let's put this let's put this up on the HQ group. See if we can put some deals together. Yeah, absolutely. So here's one that came in, I think this morning. Let me pull this up. You know, my VA, she's actually really good. She's got some good templates that she uses to um get the, all the information I need on here. She'll nice. actually put it in, yeah, in the properties tab. So if you click on a property, she'll give me all the information I need right here. And she does a great job at filling in all the fields we have on it for. Um, you know, if nice. anybody's a VA right now, you know, this is one thing that I have her do that really helps us out. I have her find the, you know, the go on, Zillow, go on realtor.com, go on Redfin, get all their prices and average it out for me. Tell me what it's going to be, 70% cash. If I'm going to buy it, creative financing, tell me what that's going to be. That saves me probably five minutes on every lead. So. Do you find that, that number to be pretty accurate? Do you think those yeah, services would, are getting a little more accurate? Yeah, I always go back and check it. I mean, Redfin's the best. You know, the Zestimate, you know, they, that's, they even admit to being 10% off. So it just gives you a ballpark, you know, when, before I actually go on the appointment, I'll pull up, you know, Redfin on my phone and look at the sold comps a little bit more. Uh, but this gives me, lets me know if I'm at least in the ballpark. Yeah. And I like that you use median instead of mean. Can you describe that math real quick? So, um, I don't know. That's not my math. So okay. yeah, I'm, not, I'm not one to be given a math. Um, <laughs> yeah. No, no, none of us are. Yeah. So that's cool. So she does that initial due diligence. So, so at this point she took the call, she did all the due diligence and then it shows up as a task. Who, who's the next person to kind of touch these? So Lo this will go to Logan. So the appointment's been set on this, um, for tomorrow. So look at the email. Her email is, I love her email. I, is love, I love cheese five twelve. <laughs> <laughs> that's going to be a deal. That's, I think it is. I think I got some. I just got a text about some good news on that. Yeah, you're gonna get some. You're gonna get some cheddar off that one. That's right. <laughs> That's funny. 
So, yeah, and then um, Logan, he'll get this. Uh, my leads manager, she goes ahead and books the appointment through here. It goes right into his Google Calendar. And, um, you know, from there, he has everything he needs right in his, um, you know, right in his phone to go out and That's awesome. Talk. Yeah. Does he use the mobile app to, to input data after the fact? You know, we, we use the mobile app more than we use the desktop. Yep. Mm -hmm. so I would good say news by the way dude they actually are about to release like drastic improvements to the mobile app oh, oh i yeah. love that uh, yeah yeah it's gonna make it a lot easier that's cool though so you guys are just in the field not uh spending too much time on the computer which is good i always like to say like investors should be doing less computer time and more like mobile in the field work yeah I can't even remember the last time I was actually on here like this to be, be candid with you. This, you know, like I said, I'm usually always on my phone, so I'm glad they're doing some improvements there. Hear that, Fusers? Get off the laptop. Use your phone more. However, if you're an in-house salesperson, then it makes sense to use your laptop, obviously, or if you're you know, limiting yourself to 30 minutes of email every day, it's easier to type on your laptop than it is to like, email on your phone. Uh, but yeah, I challenge you to spend less time on your laptop and more time in front of sellers at houses. <laughs> That's right. right. Like, that's yeah, right. It's more revenue generating tasks than that. So that's, you know, that's really our bread and butter. We'll, um, we'll move things through and put them in the transactions tab as well. Um, you know, we've got some other systems that we use to, to hand over to our dispositions manager that just work right now. I, I want to get everything. My goal is to have everything going exclusively through investor fuse, but that's a work of progress. So you're know, trying to coordinate six team members all on the same page at the same time. You know, sometimes it takes a little bit of time to, to get everybody there, but we're heading. Sure. In yeah. If you ever need a training session, you know, who to talk to, we get your whole team on that call and just figure out the process. That's right. Yeah. Now I'm probably going to take you up on that. I appreciate Dude, that. Absolutely. How much are you spending on marketing right now? Uh, we probably do. Let's see. We spent thirty nine hundred dollars last week, so we're spending probably twelve to sixteen k on marketing a month. Yeah, I'll spend sixteen k any day if I'm making six figures off from that. And that's oh, how, I mean that's how important marketing is, guys. Like, what would you say, Nick? This is the minimum that you should be spending on marketing if you expect to get a deal within the next three months. Um, right now, you know, if you're in a hot market, I would just say in general, you know, you need to be willing to drop at least five G's. You may get a deal, you know, sooner than that, you know, especially with like dancing and you follow up with people. But if you're just getting started, you know, go hard, go hard. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, too many people I talk to are only spending like a thousand bucks a month, which you know is a lot for people that are just starting out because it comes out to like twelve grand a year, right? But you gotta, you gotta, you gotta get those leads coming in, and leads are either gonna cost you in time or dollars. So, right. Uh, that was one uh, one thing um, Sean Terry said to me when I was with him and Kent, and I shared him a my marketing last year and I was like, yeah, you know, I spent 57,000 last year on marketing and I was kind of like thinking, he was gonna be like, yeah, that's pretty good. And the first thing he said was, hold on, why did you only spend 57,000 in marketing last year? And he just <laughs> ripped me for that. So it's, yeah, it's, it's huge. The amount you get in, you get out what you put into it. Yeah. It's like mining for gold, man. You're either going to be like out there just, hammering away digging for gold or you're going to pay someone else to do it right you got to mine it takes time effort and money to mine for that those little gold pieces but then you're not done right once you have the gold pieces then you need to you know convert it into cash so let's talk a little bit now like what happens when you sell it if you want to just get into the disposition side of things um any lessons you could share when it comes to that like monetizing uh deal strategy are you guys just doing like straight cash offers or are you guys getting creative so you can kind of touch on that yeah you know we've we do it all so you know if you're just going 70 percent cash 
out here, especially if you're in a hot market, you're going to get smoked all day long by other investors and realtors. You know, the chances you're going to convert just using the 70% ARV method, it's very flawed. And if you're in a hot market, you need to be a little bit more aggressive than just giving them 70%. You know, in Austin, if I get a deal that comes in in Austin, you know, we can still wholesale a deal at like 78, sometimes 80%. That's mm. how, yeah. And we'll have flippers buy and promise for, you know, 80, 85, sometimes 90%. You know, it just depends on the neighborhood. So you got to know your market. You know, additionally, you know, use all the tools in your tool belt, right? If you're just going to use cash, you're leaving a lot of deals on the table. Like those deals that don't have equity or, you know, you can do creative financing on, know all your different ways to monetize a lead. You know, we, we also do um, lease purchase as well, which has been very valuable for us because a lot of people in Texas uh, don't think you can do lease purchase. You can do lease purchase in Texas. You just got to have the right, right paperwork um, to do it. So that's been, been extremely beneficial. And then again, you know, we're, we're also a licensed brokerage. So, you know, if all those options don't work, you know, we can do a, we can give them a listing agreement. Hmm. So if somebody wants to sell a house, no matter what they want to do, we, we have some sort of way to help them and being able to, you know, find the right, right solution for the, the seller is critical. One tool isn't just going to, you know, isn't going to convert all the leads. So exactly. Yeah. I um, think a lot of newer wholesalers expect that every deal is just going to be a straight cash offer deal when that's far from the truth, especially as it, get, as it gets competitive, the more creative you are in helping them transact or, or get out of that property, the better you are at solving these people's problems, the better investor you're going to be compared to someone else. Like, um, yeah, you're just solving right. problems, right? Are you, are you doing any like short sale or foreclosure stuff? Um, they owe too much. We don't do, yeah, we don't do um, short sales just because they take so long. Like we will do short sales if the spread's really big, but we try to steer away from them just because they take a long time. Yeah. Um, no, our, our main um, way of monetizing these deals is still through cash and creative financing. And then we also get a lot of um, lease options and um, listing agreements as well. Tight. Are you uh, a follower of the Joe McCall lease options strategy? Yeah. Lease options. Absolutely. I just went through his entire course. We digested that. We like literally binge watched it in two days and then um, went out and started locking up lease option deals. So that was, uh, That's crazy. that was huge for us because lease option, you can pretty much give the seller what they want. So if they, you know, they have a hundred dollar house, you can pay pretty close to a hundred thousand, you know, especially in a hot market and still, still make money. And if they're willing and, to lease it out for a couple months or two a year. Right. Right. And they walk away making more than they would if they were to sell with a realtor. So it's a very attractive option for uh, a lot of sellers to, to go with that. Yeah. So dude, what's next? Million dollar months? That's it. Yeah. You know, I mean, they say if you're not on Forbes, keep working. So, you know, as for, you know, we've we've definitely progressed, but you know, we're we're not where we need to be yet. So we're just going to keep our head down, keep working, and um, you know, see what we can do to try to you know take it as far as we can take it. Do you have specific goals and timelines set? Yeah, I'd like to get to um, uh, 250k a month by end of year. So that's that's a strong goal of mine right now and the team. Yeah. yeah we got, um, we got a lot of <clears throat> KPIs we're, we're following to, to get us there. So yeah, as long as we hit our KPIs, we'll be there. Um, and then How much, do you have a KPI for a deal or a cost per deal? Yeah. You guess? So, so I analyze that every quarter you know, after I do my KPIs weekly, I'll look at what my cost per deal was for the quarter. Um, you know, it's, it's around 2000 for us here in Austin, San Antonio area. And, you know, from, from what I'm hearing and other investors in the country, that's, 
Yeah, it's still pretty late. A lot of people are paying up to $5,000 a lead, like I was saying earlier. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we just have had, you know, got a really good team that, you know, does a great job at building rapport and converting these people. And then additionally, we've got systems like Investor Fuse that follow up with people. So that helps keep our cost per deal down. Yep. So one real quick question, because I know people are probably wondering how you, how you found the people that you did that are rock stars. Mm -hmm. Give us a quick uh, story about how you found those people. Yeah. So, you know, just to recap, Logan, he was actually the first person I met in Austin and he owned a, owned a gym. I walked into the gym and he greeted me and gave me a t-shirt and let me work out that day. And we just kind of hit it off. And nice. then, yeah, we built a, a really strong friendship after that. Um, he, um, he came on about a year ago. Um, my dispositions manager, uh, I met him down in my amenities lounge. I was playing pool and he came over with a beer in his hand and was like, Hey, you guys mind if I get in on the next game? And then he's like, yeah, you know, oh, yeah, you guys do real estate. So do I. And you know, you know Sean Terry and you know, we kind of just hit it off from there. No way. He, was, he was house sitting for somebody that was in my building. He lives there in San Diego right now. Oh, so he's wow. in San Diego. We're here in Austin. And, um, that's how it's kind of, yeah, that's how I met him. And he's been, he's been a rock star. That's just killer. He's you know, 31 years old, very you know, entrepreneurial, very smart. Um, mm. so he's been, been huge, huge asset to the team. My inside salesperson, he was actually my intern when I was working at Indeed. So he interned underneath me and, um, I knew he was hungry from the very beginning. You know, I saw the way that he would help me with my, my workload at Indeed. And at the same time, he was asking me about real estate. He was very interested in that even when he was my intern. So he, um, you know, I let him watch all the Sean Terry videos and helped him get his first mail campaign out, helped him get his first deal. And he was working at Indeed. He got hired full time. And he's like, dude, I hate this stuff at Indeed. He's like, can I please, is there anything, you know, and I was like, yeah, I mean, actually, I'm working on a position right now. You know, you'll be the first person that, you know, I'll come out and reach out to. And I actually, he, he didn't say anything to me, but I, once I had that position finalized, I reached out to him. And um, it was just really kind of serendipitous timing on, you know, where he was with his career indeed and where he's trying to go like personally, professionally. So it worked out good. Hmm. Yeah. You know, our leads manager, our leads managers, they come from Ibis. Ibis has been great. They're, um, you know, if anybody's looking for a leads manager, I'd recommend them. It's affordable. You know, she is in the Philippines, but she builds rapport with people great here in America. She doesn't have like a very thick accent at all. Her accent's yeah. very Americanized. Um, we had to interview five of them to get the right one. So right. if you consider using Ibis, you know, you might have to interview a few, but yeah. Uh, it's like a so year I, sh now. I should say, since we have the service now that, basically ties into Ivis, the live answer service. We mm -hmm. actually have like a pool of Ivis virtual assistants that are doing just that first, uh, first contact task. So they're like uh, the live answering service that you can get a la carte right now. It's the doors are closed, but I think when this is released, they'll, it'll be back open. A la carte is just an extra 500 bucks per month. And you can have this lead manager take all your inbound calls and then make all missed call uh, follow-up attempts. They'll follow up up to six times before just putting them on a sequence. So mm -hmm. yeah, that takes such a huge amount of time off your plate. You're doing a lot of inbound marketing and you're doing it all yourself. Like that, the pain of having to do that is not worth it. So we just put this system together using, you know, Rob's VAs. And like you said, they're trained in how to talk to sellers, which is such a benefit over all of the other answering services that people use right now, like Pat live, uh, not, not the best for real estate where you're spending all this money on leads and some random person's talking to them. So yeah, I definitely recommend uh, Ivis if you're looking for a full, full time BA to do other stuff as well. And then you can check out our answering service. If you go to investorview.com slash plus, you can see more information about that. Um, and yeah, to uh, people have objections about the accent and honestly, Filipinos sound like Americans. Like, 
the culture there is very Americanized. Like I, I went there last year to visit our team, the best Fuse tech support team. And they're all, you know, wearing Adidas and they're just like Americans, like, uh, and they talk just like us and they like hamburgers just like us. So it's just like a very, it's interesting that we're the, like the same, have the same values, but separated by so much distance. So yeah. Cool. But that was a, that was a useful breakdown of how you kind of formed your team. And it's funny that a lot of it was just serendipity. I think people have to realize that one, you're not going to be able to scale your business without a team. And two, you're not going to be able to have a team unless you develop a really keen eye for talent, even out in public, like you were just playing pool yet. You still hit it off with this guy and you could tell he was a sharp guy, uh, a hustler, you know, has some real estate experience. So just like going on about your day and, and having that, that lens on to see people, uh, in, in, in terms of talent, I think is a huge entrepreneurial asset. If you can do that because a lot of the people that you hire might be just that people that you meet, uh, you know, could be your personal trainer is a really personal person and you need someone like that to go on your appointments with, et cetera. Like people you meet in your life, don't think that everyone that you're going to hire is going to come from like a job ad or a recruiter. The people that you interact with day to day is the best judge of character, you know, so don't want to take up any more of your time, man. You have another 150 K to make this month to hit your mark. Right. So, uh, thank you so much for your time joining us and kind of just sharing a little bit about your story. It's definitely crazy that you can do this business and, and go from like, you know, being a personal trainer three years ago to closing six figure months like that. That is admirable. Um, do you have any parting words? for those out there that uh, are at that phase where they might have done their first deal or they're about to close their first deal, but they see the light at the end of the tunnel and they want to just keep progressing and scaling up what they need to be focusing on. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of transferable to any business, but just don't quit, right? So every single day, just put one foot in front of the other and you're gonna get punched in the mouth so many times in this business if you're not getting punched in the mouth at least, you know, a few times a week, then you're probably not doing something right. So expect to, um, you know, to take some bumps, but continue to, um, continue to progress forward and, right. and, and don't give up. No. And I mean, I've, I still haven't arrived, right? Like I'm still hitting, you know, bumps in the road every single day. Like I'm still getting you know, knocked down and getting back up. So, you just got to have that muscle to, to just keep going and have some, some grit to get through, you know, the beginning of starting a business. And that's, I think that's really the, probably the best, best thing that I've, I've done. It's just every time I fall, I'll get back up. Hell yeah, man. Respect. If you have any, uh, if people have any extra questions or want to just hit you up, do you have a best way to contact you? Yeah, go ahead and um, message me. My, my website is montesellnow.com. Um, so you can, you can get a hold of me via email at Perry at want to sell and, uh, glad to, glad to correspond with you that way. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's, that's probably the best way to reach out. Awesome. So kudos to you for taking that leap of faith and just crushing it this year. And yeah, we'll talk soon, man. Thanks again for your time and peace out investor fuse community. See you. Cool. The wolf, Austin, guys, the wolf of Austin, Texas. We'll get you on that Forbes list. Soon. Yes, That's right. Tell Logan, tell Logan we said what's up. Hell yeah, we'll do. All right, guys. See you. All right. Bye.